Keith and Methel, and I'm a computational mathematician at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I want to welcome you all to the FEM at LLNL seminar series. For those of you who are here for the first time, you can learn more about the series and join our mailing list at mfm.org slash seminar. That being said, it is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Ricardo Venuesa as our speaker today. Ricardo is an associate professor at the Department of Engineering Mechanics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He's also a researcher at the KTH Climate Action Center and vice director of the KTH Digitalization Platform. His research combines numerical simulations and data-driven methods to understand and model complex wall-bounded turbulent flows, such as the boundary layers developing around wings and urban environments. He has received, among others, an ERC Consolidator Grant and the Guran Gustafsson Award for Young Researchers. I've been following Ricardo's work for the past few years, and I'm really ex excited about this talk. So without further ado, please take it away, Ricardo. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to deliver this seminar. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about modeling and controlling turbulent flows through deep learning. And uh, this research is funded, among others, by the ERC, the European Research Council. Um, sorry for the um, change of date with respect to last week, but uh, I can see the old date in the slides. But uh, it's great that we can be together today and discuss this, uh, these results. So I would like to start with this um, uh, motivation slide that, uh, well, that one can borrow from Airbus. Uh, so for a typical uh, airliner, uh, what you can see is the contribution towards the total drag of different parts of the airplane. And around 50% of the drag comes from the wings that you can see here in, in green. Uh, it turns out that if one looks at the wing and the different components of the drag, of the drag from wings, uh, around 50% of that comes from the friction, so basically turbulent boundary layers developing around the surfaces of the wings. And around 40% of that comes from the lift induced component. And the lift induced drag is due to the uh, wind tip vortices that form here uh, at the end of the wing, at the wind tip. Uh, and these two uh, aspects of the total drag uh, can be studied with high fidelity simulations. No? So I will be telling you a little bit about some of the simulations that we do in my group and then how we can use uh, data driven uh, methods to try to understand the flow better, make predictions, and control it. The code that we use to perform our um, numerical simulations is NEC 5000, which is a spectral element code um, developed by Fisher and others, uh, which combines the geometrical flexibility of finite elements and the uh, convergence properties of high order spectral methods, uh, which make this code uh, a very nice candidate to perform DNS or high fidelity uh, large scale simulations uh, of turbulent flows at high resolution numbers in quite complex geometries, not uh, full complexity at the industrial level, but we can do wings, we can do three-dimensional wings, uh, things like that, that I'll be showing you in the next uh, in the next slides. We have been using this code for quite some years now, and uh, the performance that we can obtain from it is actually quite, um, quite remarkable. Um, so basically, I will show you, and let me know if you don't see the video, this is a direct numerical simulation of um, the turbulent flow around an ACA 4412 wind section. The Reynolds number of 400,000, 5 dB angles of attack. This simulation is now some years old. What you can see is the vertical structures developing around the, the wing, the wind section. And we can actually see uh, quite some, uh, or quite a number of complex phenomena, including the energization of the large scales on the suction side because of the average pressure gradient. We have incipient separation. Actually, the flow is attached in the mean, but 30% of the time is actually going uh, in the negative uh, stream wise direction. Uh, we can see how the two boundary layers merge here after the shear layer um, downstream of the train edge. And we will see that on the pressure side, uh, we have a mild favorable pressure gradient, which is accelerating the boundary layer, and it's able to uh, attenuate some of the turbulent fluctuations uh, that one can uh, observe there. So it's actually quite um, quite remarkable uh, the level of detail that one can achieve, even with this simulation that is now five, six, maybe seven years old, something like that, um, where we can actually uh, capture all the coherent structures, all the phenomena in the wake, all the phenomena in the turbulent boundary layers, which will help us in principle to, to assess all these components uh, that contribute towards the, towards the drag. Huh? That's what we would try to, to analyze. 
Um, so basically, uh, what we have been doing uh, in the past years, and this is an article from 2018, yeah, the reference is here in the Journal of Heat and Fluid Flow, uh, we can look at these high fidelity simulations for a wide range of Reynolds numbers, going from 100,000 all the way up to a million, where you can actually see the progressive increase of scale separation and complexity on this flow. So this wing at a Reynolds number of 1 million is actually a quite well-resolved simulation, which allows us to, to really understand uh, the complex effects of curvature, pressure gradients, uh, shear layers, wakes, uh, and transition to turbulence. So we actually can have quite some level of detail in this complex flow case. Um, the only problem of these simulations is what you can see here. <clears throat> so typically the uh, standard setup of Nectar 1000 is relying on conformal meshes, which uh, as you can see, uh, because of the mesh requirements close to the wing, uh, this leads to very elongated elements in the far field, right? So that means that we will have very uh, elements with a very high aspect ratio, which will significantly increase the pressure iterations uh, and therefore will uh, slow down the computation uh, if we want to go to very high Reynolds numbers. Uh, still, this simulation at a Reynolds number of 1 million had over 2 billion grid points, so it's a quite large simulation, it scales pretty well, but we want to be able to uh, explore other alternatives, no? to be able to, to harness all the potential of um, NEC 5000 and its uh, parallel capabilities. And that's where adaptive meshing comes. No? So uh, there's some development uh, being done at KTH in terms of um, uh, non-conformal meshing. Uh, so one can actually have much more flexibility in the meshing capabilities and also adaptive mesh refinement. So the, the code is uh, based on uh, spectral error estimators, is able to um, refine automatically in the regions of the domain where we need more resolution. Uh, you can see this cross plane here, where we have much more resolution close to the wing section. Uh, this, by the way, is a finite wing. Yeah? So this is a NACA 0012 with a rounded wind tip, which means that uh, because of the pressure difference, this has an angle of attack of five degrees, uh, because of the pressure difference, uh, we uh, observe the development of this wind tip vortex rolling around the, the wind tip. Uh, and we can actually see in these planes how the mesh um, adaptation is following the development of this wind tip vortex. So one can actually have a very good um, characterization of this uh, important element, the wind tip vortex. And we can, uh, with this uh, series of simulations that we are currently conducting, uh, analyze quite well the impact of wind hypothesis and lift induced drag in, this, uh, in these configurations. So this is work that uh, is carried out by Sia Bastosi, a postdoc in my group, who will be presented in the earliest later this year. And just to let you know that we have a number of cases with rounded wind tips at different angles of attack. This is a Reynolds number of 200,000, but we are increasing also the Reynolds number. And we will have a complete sets of turbulence statistics, including budgets, uh, time series, instantaneous fields, uh, so you sh we should have a quite complete database uh, of these uh, interesting flow cases. So this is just to give you an idea of what we do in terms of uh, high fidelity simulations. And of course, the availability of high quality data uh, enables us to exploit data driven methods. No? And that's uh, where we come into the main topic of today and is uh, how we can uh, apply machine learning to fluid mechanics. Uh, and, and of course, the availability of data helps in this. No? Uh, 20 years ago, there was a seminal study by Milano Kumosakos where we could actually well, model the near world region of channels with uh, deep neural networks. More recently, there has been a quite quick increase of um, work uh, on using machine learning for fluid mechanics in the context of sub scale modeling for LES, development of inflow and boundary conditions, trans modeling, uh, flow control, and even the usage of uh, physics informed neural networks for uh, several applications having to do with sensing. So essentially, there are many, many areas where one can uh, apply machine learning in fluid mechanics. We are learning how to leverage all the potential. Um, we have a recent article uh, together with Steve Branton. So you can see the reference here. It was published in Nature Computational Science, where Steve and I uh, assessed the potential of CFD and machine learning together. So what we document in this article is that um, what is possible with uh, machine learning is that we can uh, accelerate DNS, so we can have more efficient ways of solving the um, governing equations with, with DNS. We can have better ways to model turbulence, both in the context of, of RANS and LES, and we can develop more robust and uh, general 
uh, strategies for reduce order models. No? So there's quite some directions where uh, machine learning can help CFD. I want to emphasize that this is not at all meaning that we can replace CFD with machine learning. That's not going to be possible. That's not what we are doing here. What we're doing is identifying areas within CFD where machine learning can actually help. So you can have a quite detailed view of all these applications in this review paper that I have with, uh, with Steve. And uh, in this context, I also think that uh, interpretability of deep learning models is quite essential. Um, there are some machine learning methods that are interpretable, but deep learning is allowing us to obtain better accuracy and better performance in many applications. But deep learning is typically associated with black box models. It turns out, and there is some work from Kramer and others, there is some work that we have in Nature Machine Intelligence together with Petr Simasek, where we show the possibilities of using a symbolic regression, inductive uh, biases, uh, to be able to produce symbolic equations that allow us to reproduce some of the performance of the deep learning models. So, in principle, being able to have a deep learning model which is also interpretable is, um, well, it could be quite, uh, quite important, not only for the deployment of these applications, but also to try to learn something about the physics as well. So, this is uh, an area that I believe has quite some, some potential. Good. And then today I will be uh, talking about various examples where we can apply machine learning to fluid mechanics in different areas. So this is my own research uh, together with my group and my collaborators. Uh, and I will start by telling you about how we can use machine learning for non-intrusive sensing. Non-intrusive sensing um, is basically uh, described as being able to measure some part of the flow without having to stick a sensor there. Right? So we are able to, uh, for example, measure at the wall. And then based on those measurements at the wall, we can try to predict what happens above the wall at different locations. And that's what I'm showing here schematically. So we will basically be using the information at the blue plane, which is the wall. Uh, for instance, the two wall shear stress components and the wall pressure uh, to be able to predict the velocity fluctuations on the yellow plane, which is above the wall. Um, basically uh, the three velocity fluctuations based on that wall information using computer vision tools uh, for example convolutional neural networks and other tools that i will be mentioning later on so this is uh, interesting from the perspective of closed loop control because if i know what the flow is doing i can have a better chance at controlling it uh, with much more much more chances of, of getting successful you know, in attenuating certain scales and achieving drug, uh, drug reduction uh, all these results are actually shown in this reference that you see here in the journal of fluid mechanics. So you can find all the details there, but I will be highlighting some of the most interesting applications. <clears throat> and is that we conducted uh, using the Fourier Chebyshev code Simpson from KTH. Uh, we did uh, perform two DNSs uh, at Arita 180 and 550. These are open channels. And the reason to use an open channel is to simplify the dynamics of the large scales. And uh, using the DNS data, we can find mappings that can help us correlate the information at the wall with what happens above the wall. Okay? The domain is large enough to contain most of the large scales. Uh, and in principle, this data uh, should be able to help us no, in, this, um, in this performance uh, for the predictions that we want to make. So what one can do, I mean, to analyze uh, data uh, using deep learning is that well, one can use fully connected networks, which as you can see here, um, are characterized by all the neurons being connected with the neurons of the next layer. Uh, but these networks are not very good uh, in identifying patterns in images, no? because uh, all the, the data is not organized spatially when coming into a network. However, uh, in CNNs, convolutional neural networks, which are widely used in computer vision, what I have is this sort of a structure here where I have a little kernel, which is a 2D filter, that is being sweeping through the input and producing a feature map at the output based on the information at the input. And uh, of course, turbulence uh, exhibits patterns, exhibits, exhibits spatial correlations that one can try to exploit through the use of these convolutional filters. So that's the key of what we're going to be describing today. So this is one of the architectures that we use. We're using now even deeper neural networks, but this one works actually pretty well. So it's a deep neural network with six hidden layers. We have three planes in the input, uh, which are the two wall shear stress components and the wall pressure. Three planes in the output, which are the three velocity fluctuations at the target location. And these are the number of filters that we have in each of the layers. So basically, 
each of the filters is uh, identifying one or several features in the data. Okay, this is how comp uh, convolutional neural networks uh, work. And these uh, features, <coughs> they can be um, edges, they can be lines, circles, regions of recirculation. In the first layers, we will be identifying features that are more abstract and simpler. And in the layers closer to the output, due to the concatenated application of convolutions, we can build progressively more and more complicated features, progressively more and more complicated structures. And that's the key, right? So uh, deep neural networks are learning in a hierarchical way, and that's how turbulence works as well, right? It's quite hierarchical in the way that smaller scales progressively um, assemble more and more complex features in the flow. So that's why uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, are in principle uh, suitable to perform predictions in uh, deep, uh, I mean, deep neural networks uh, in turbulent flows. Uh, so this is a schematic of what we want to uh, achieve. On the left, we have the three inputs, eh, which are measured at the wall. And on the right, I'm showing you the three velocity fluctuation components at the target location, which is what we want to predict. Once again, all the information is shown in this JFM paper eh, from last year. So feel free to uh, access there for more, more details. And what I told you so far is what we call the FCN method, a fully convolutional network. But it's also possible to use what we call the FCN POD, which combines convolutional networks and proper orthogonal decomposition, also PCA in the context of machine learning. Uh, essentially, what we do is that we take our plane, we uh, make these subdivisions uh, into these smaller subdomains, and the key is that we decompose the spatiotemporal signal eh, into spatial modes and temporal coefficients, right? That's the standard uh, way of doing POD. The key of these subdivisions is that each scale larger than this domain is lumped into the first mode, which means that uh, if we choose wisely these subdomains that I'm showing here, then we're going to be able to uh, find a good reconstruction of the total energy without too many nodes, right? So we can be able to actually get reasonable reconstructions without uh, having to predict thousands of modes in the, in the turbulent flow. And this approach, where we are actually only predicting the temporal coefficients, we're not predicting anything about the spatial information because that comes into the spatial modes, that's the FCM POD method. And we're going to see in which cases it's better to use one or the other. Okay. So here I'm showing you uh, instantaneous velocity fluctuations in the stream was direction. The first column is at y plus 15, so that's uh, in the near world region. Second column, y plus 100, that's in the outer region. And the reference is the third row, that's the DNS. Eh? So this is what we are trying to, to reprodu reproduce. The first row are predictions from the extended POD method. An extended POD is basically, is formally equivalent to linear stochastic estimation. So it's basically a linear prediction between the input and the output. And as we know, turbulence is a multi-scale phenomenon where the uh, energy transfer mechanisms have two parts. One is linear, which is the superposition of large scales onto small scales, and another one that is non-linear, which is the modulation. And of course, the uh, extended POD is not going to be able to reproduce the nonlinear modulation effects. So what we are seeing here are basically the linear predictions where, well, we can observe a significant attenuation of the fluctuations compared with the reference. And also uh, we can see that the filter, that the fields are smoother. So we are capturing only part of the uh, behavior of the flow, but some of the details that have to do with the nonlinear modulation are actually lost due to the uh, prediction method that we are using. Um, if we look at the FCN method, which is when we predict directly the whole field without any intermediate step, that's the fourth row. And we can see that at y plus 15, so these two uh, planes, the predictions are very good. We can almost nail the flow at y plus 15 with the FCN method. Far away from the wall, the correlation between the input and the output decreases, therefore it's not so easy to make predictions. And what we can actually see is that the FCM POD method performs better. So we see some attenuation of the fluctuations, but we can still find where the streaks are. And that's interesting because that means that in the outer region where the flow is dominated by fewer large energetic uh, structures, uh, then uh, we don't need to really predict all the signals, but you know, just take at the dominant uh, dynamics that are encapsulated into those POD modes and then predict the temporal dynamics of those modes. And that's the key here, right? So 
close to the wall, you should use the FCM because of you, you cannot really use few beauty modes to really encapsulate most of the dynamics of the flow. But farther away from the wall, it's actually okay to use the FCM POD and we get actually better results. So this is from an instantaneous point of view. But if we look at the statistics, if we look at the, um, uh, from left to right, the string-wise, wall normal and span-wise velocity fluctuations, what we can actually see uh, in black is the DNS. Uh, the triangle is the FCM method. Uh, the blue, sorry for that, the blue dot is the FCM POD and the square is the linear method, the extended POD. What we can see, first of all, is that this near world peak, also from a statistical point of view, is very well predicted. We have less than 1% error in the near wall um, predictions uh, with the FCN method. All the predictions get worse farther away from the wall, but we are able to outperform the linear method, which is good. And then far away from the wall, then the FCN POD catches up and it becomes better than the FCN. So that's what we observe. And we get 26% error with FCM POD at one plus 100, which in principle is still quite okay because we are able to identify the location of the dominant structures in the flow, okay? <clears throat> there is something that is quite interesting to exploit in the context of turbulence and that's transfer learning. So transfer learning is essentially being able to use what we learn in one case uh, in another task that is not too similar, but not too different. Um, so let's say that we want to uh, use what we learned to predict at Y plus 15 to train a network at Y plus 50. So that's farther away from the world. <clears throat> and it turns out that, as I mentioned before, one can associate the first layers with the more abstract and smaller things, and the last layer with the more concrete and larger elements on the floor. So that means that I can actually uh, do transfer learning. So I can freeze the three first layers from Y plus 15 and only train the three last ones, which will allow us to, in principle, um, exploit uh, and focus only on the large scales that will be different, whereas the smaller scales should be more similar at Y plus 15 and Y plus 50. Well, <clears throat> doing it like this, we can obtain very similar error levels, but we can reduce the training time by a factor of more than four. So that's actually quite encouraging by being able to reuse those weights that we have in, a, in one of the cases that we, that we can observe before. Even more interestingly, we can reduce what we learn at Aritao 180 for Aritao 550. So uh, what we do here in this, uh, in this uh, analysis is that we take the weights of the simulation at uh, Aritao 180 and we start the training at 550 from those weights. So we don't do any random initialization. We don't do any algorithm for initialization of the weights. We take the weights from Arita 180. And what we observe is that you can reduce the amount of training data by a factor of four again, obtaining the same results. And this is uh, actually quite remarkable because of course the simulation at 180 is significantly cheaper. You can basically run in a laptop almost, right? So if we are able to be smart and exploit properly the, the characteristics of these uh, transfer learning uh, applications, we can, in a way, uh, get away with producing data much, much cheaper, and then very few simulations of the very specific, very expensive applications, we can reduce the computational time of those. And that's something that we should be exploiting and leveraging uh, in all the uh, turbulence applications that we have for deep learning, not only for achieving better accuracy and well, basically to reduce uh, computer time, but also for the sustainability of these uh, applications that we're considering. All the details are provided in the JFM paper, so you can actually check it out for more, um, for more insight there, okay? That was the first application. The second one is also non-intrusive sensing, but we're going to consider that the sensors that we're using from the wall are much coarser because I'm so far considering that I have a DNS uh, at the wall, but if we do this experimentally, we will not have a DNS. We will have a much coarser resolution uh, for the wall quantities, and we need to be able to account for that. <clears throat> to do this type of prediction, we are going to downsample the information at the wall from the input eh, to basically mimic the resolution that you have in an experiment, and we're going to be using GANs. GANs are generative adversarial networks, which, as you can see here, are based on the following principle. We have two networks working together. One is the generator, which is producing high resolution images from low resolution ones, uh, trying to follow the statistical properties of the reference high resolution data set. 
and the discriminator needs to uh, identify whether a high resolution image comes from the generator or it is uh, from the original data set if it's actually a, a true high resolution image uh, and of course these two networks have antagonic roles they're trained together using game theory and they both get progressively better at their own jobs so the generator ends up being really good at fooling the discriminator and producing high quality physically realistic um, high resolution image so this network has two steps. In the first step, we are uh, obtaining high resolution data at the wall from low resolution data at the wall. And in the second step, we use the high resolution data at the wall to produce predictions above the wall of the turbulence quantities. So we first increase the resolution and second, we use that high resolution input to make predictions above the wall. And this is what we can see here. Uh, by the way, all these results are shown in, the, in physics of fluids in this journal that you can see here, also from last year. Here we have the DNS of the um, stringwise um, wall shear stress in the, in the stringwise selection instantaneously. So this is instantaneous stringwise wall shear stress. Uh, in the top row, we are downsampling. So we are reducing the resolution by 4, 8, and 16 uh, times squared. Okay? So in each direction, a factor of 16. Uh, you can see that this panel over here starts to look a lot <coughs> like what you will have in an experiment. No? You start to have coarse measurements you start to lose the spatial information uh, and that's what the GANs need to uh, take care of now. Uh, in the second row, you can actually see the predictions, which we want to compare with the DNS. The predictions are really good in the low resolution cases, but even in the high resolution cases, but even when I downsample significantly, you can see that here we have some attenuation of the fluctuations, but we can find that the streaks are in the right location, they have the right sizes, they have the right spacing, and they are physical. So if we want to do flow control uh, with a very, very coarse input, I'm actually able to obtain very good physically consistent predictions of the flow that will help us uh, to perform a better uh, flow control strategy. Okay? So this is something to keep in mind. And if we look at the predictions above the wall, what I'm showing you by columns are Y plus 15, 30, 50, and 100. So farther and farther away from the wall. The first row is the DNS. As I go down, we have down sampling factor of, of 4, 8, and 16 squared. Uh, so, of course, the easiest prediction is this one over here, eh, because that's close to the wall with a small down sampling, and the predictions are excellent. And the hardest prediction is this one over here. I'm comparing this panel with this one at the top, which is the DNS. Now, of course, uh, the prediction. Uh, exhibits quite some attenuation. This is a very challenging prediction. But what is interesting is that still I can find the location of the large scale streaks, their sizes, and their level of fluctuation. I mean, we have some attenuation, but the relative level of fluctuation is still recovered. So again, if I want to do large scale control, uh, this approach can actually help me to identify quite well where those large scales are. <clears throat> even for an experimental implementation where the input is actually quite coarse. So GANS is a, a very good tool also for super resolution and predictions in the context of turbulent flows. <clears throat> the next prediction uh, and the next application is going to go in the opposite direction. Instead of going from the wall to above the wall, I'm going to consider what happens if I use information from above the wall to predict something closer to the wall. And this could be applied for wall modeling. Yeah? This uh, study is published in archive, yeah? so you can see all the um, details over here. Uh, and what we want to do is to assess whether using the outer flow information, we can um, develop something that could be helpful for off-wall boundary conditions. Yeah? So in a way that I can replace the whole near wall region by a wall model and then uh, well, significantly increase the computational efficiency of our simulations. So what I'm doing here is to keep taking a turbulent channel. This is uh, something similar to what Mithuna and Jimenez did some years ago. They were basically in the overlap region, really scaling the flow uh, above the wall to put it closer to the wall inside the overlap region, exploiting the self-similarity of these larger scales in the, in the overlap region. Um, what we are doing is to use CNNs to make that prediction. So essentially, <laughs> As an input, uh, we have the Y plus 100 plane, which is the top row. Uh, we're going to show the U, V, and W fluctuations, and the output would be a Y plus 50. So still in the overlap region, but closer to the wall. 
The third row is the prediction. So we want to compare the U, V, and W fluctuations with the reference. Well, what we can actually see is that the U is in quite good agreement. The V exhibits a little bit of deviation, but still the spatial patterns are quite well reproduced. But this, this prediction is much harder than the previous one for two reasons. The first one is when you use the wall information to predict above the wall, uh, the wall contains all the small scale information, right? Through the superposition of those large scales uh, that you are having, a, that they have an imprint at the wall. Uh, and also when we are using that prediction, uh, the receptive field is able to capture all the information in one scale. If we do the opposite, if we try to use the large scales to predict the smaller ones, uh, we have a too small uh, receptive field to capture all the information in that structure. And of course, we're missing the small scales um, that would be um, basically uh, observed in the smaller ones, right, from the, the imprint of the large ones. Uh, and there's not going to be an easy way to make this prediction. Uh, however, um, as an exercise, I mean, this sort of prediction is quite interesting. We see that the power spectral densities, this is the 2D spectra by plus 50, they're in quite good agreement. Of course, we're missing the small scales. Uh, that's, that's something that we can observe here. And some of the energetic content is displaced in the V and W components of the spectrum. Uh, we get overall 19% error in the predictions, which is a reasonable prediction is a decent prediction, but of course, um, this could be improved uh, perhaps by uh, playing a little bit with the renormalization with max pooling in the first layers and also using perhaps GANs to reconstruct some of these smaller scales. I also want to say that even if we had a perfect prediction of the near wall plane, that doesn't mean that that would be the perfect uh, model uh, for a wall model approach. I mean, perhaps one should do something else based on reinforcement learning or other approaches, uh, but this is an interesting, uh, step towards being able to make these sort of predictions uh, in the context of modeling uh, applications. Okay. Now, we are now finished with the prediction part. We're going to be talking about reduce order models in turbulence. And for that, we're going to be using autoencoders. And I will tell you more about these architectures, these autoencoders. So when we want to build a reduce order model uh, and an approach that comes to mind very quickly is proper orthogonal decomposition, is POD, which we mentioned before. Uh, POD has two interesting properties. It's optimal, which means that we have uh, basically the best possible linear reconstruction with modes that have progressively less and less contribution towards the overall reconstruction. And then uh, these modes are orthogonal, which is another important property uh, if we think of interpretability of these modes. Um, the idea is to be able to use autoencoders so that we can obtain a non-linear model decomposition, which hopefully will be much more compact than a linear one, uh, but retaining the properties of optimality and orthogonality. And that I will tell you more about it. All the details of this study are published in, this year in the journal Expert Systems with Applications, as the work by Hamid Reza Ibasi and others, uh, so you can get all the details there. But uh, just to give you some uh, context, there's quite some work now on being able to develop um, reduce order models in turbulence or in fluid mechanics, I should say, using neural networks, but not so much in turbulence. I mean, at the end of the day, everything works in a cylinder at Reynolds number 100, right? But if you go to a turbulent flow, uh, then things are a bit more complicated. So we use this um, database of, uh, of the flow around two obstacles. This is a very simplified urban environment, but this is quite high quality data. You can see the level of detail of these uh, turbulent structures. Uh, the database, you can find it in Lafita and others in physics of fluids and in other references. And um, what you can see, we have over 1000 instantaneous snapshots. Okay? So we can have quite some data. And we're going to take the plane at the middle of the two obstacles <clears throat> to be able to assess the capabilities of autoencoders in producing reduce order models. Okay, so this is a 3D case. This is a complex turbulent flow with quite some shedding, which makes it an interesting case for model decomposition, but as I mentioned, with quite some um, complexity. So what are autoencoders? Well, you can see a schematic representation of the autoencoder here. The idea of these deep neural networks is to uh, start on the original data, progressively reduce the dimension by using CNNs. Eh? So we are progressively reducing the dimension uh, by still exploiting the spatial information in the data. Uh, in the latent space, we will obtain a very compact representation of the flow. And then in the second part, which is the decoder, we want to recover the original data. So this network is trained to have a very good reconstruction of the original data 
while obtaining a very compressed version of that original database in the latent space. Okay. So that's basically how convolutional autoencoders work. And there is one way uh, proposed by Fukami and others, this is Koji Fukagata's group, uh, to be able to um, look at this uh, optimality. No? So you can have modes that are having less and less contribution towards the reconstruction. And this is the framework of the hierarchical autoencoder. In this framework, <coughs> you start with one autoencoder, you set the dimension of the latent space to one, so you obtain one latent variable, yeah, which allows you to make the reconstruction. Then you have another autoencoder in which the dimension of the latent space is two. You set the first latent variable to one and you obtain the second one. And this second one has a smaller contribution towards the reconstruction of the signal. And you can do that recursively in such a way that you keep getting more and more vectors for this latent space such that in the end uh, you have a list of latent vectors which have lower and lower contributions towards the reconstruction of the original signal. <clears throat> this was tested by, um, by this group in a 2D cylinder, which worked quite well, uh, but not in turbulent flows. We will do it now for turbulent flows. And this, even if it's, one can argue that this is optimal in the sense that you have a rank set of modes, these are, modes are not orthogonal. And that's an important property if you want to obtain some uh, interpretability of these modes. Okay. So how can we try to um, promote learning uh, autoencoder models that are, um, well, that are uh, orthogonal no? in terms of its uh, latent variables? We're going to be using the framework of the variational autoencoders, and in particular the beta variational autoencoders, which will allow us to introduce some stochasticity in the latent space. So let's consider P of X as the distribution of the original data, P of R as the distribution of the data in the latent space, and we want to maximize this quantity, which is the marginal likelihood. The marginal likelihood would basically be the approximation of P of X, which is the original data, given the parameters theta of the neural network. Okay, so we want to maximize this quantity over here. <clears throat> In variational autoencoders, uh, this probability here is a probabilistic decoder. Okay? So basically it's a gener generative model that takes me from the uh, latent space to the original space. And this probability, this conditional probability that you can see here, that's a probabilistic encoder. It's a recognition model that will take us from the original space to the latent one. Okay, so these are the variables, these are the definitions that we can consider when we're looking at these uh, autoencoders, uh, which are variational autoencoders. And what characterizes these variational autoencoders is that the encoder part, uh, remember this conditional probability, it's a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that means that we're going to be able to introduce that stochasticity and we can use normally distributed noise. Eh? So that's a random number that we are adding here in the latent variables to be able to take samples from this latent space. It can be shown that the loss function of the beta variation autoencoder uh, looks like this, where beta is one hyperparameter, is one regularization term, which allows us to promote learning statistically independent latent variables, okay? So the latent variables, the variables in the latent space, uh, well, we're promoting the learning of those statistically independent variables. Uh, and this is done through minimizing the distance between P of R, remember that's the distribution of the data in the latent space and the product of its marginals. That's what we are doing with this, uh, with this latent, uh, with this loss function and this penalty term that we're introducing. So what we're having is uh, basically a disentangled and parsimonious latent space. We're promoting a latent space with a statistically independent variables that is of the minimum uh, dimension possible. Uh, so a large value of beta will allow, allow us to uh, obtain a disentangled and parsimonious latent space. Of course, at the cost of having worse reconstructions. That's also something that is clear. No? We need to keep that in mind. Okay, nothing comes for free. So there are two parts, of course, of the variational autoencoder. The decoder, as I mentioned, takes me from the latent space to the original space, and the encoder takes us from the original to the latent space, where we can observe this stochasticity, yeah? so this distribution the latent space as a mean, a standard deviation, and some noise that we are injecting to be able to sample from it. Yeah? So that's the whole, the whole idea. So some results, we are showing you the uh, streamwise flow velocity 
of a particular snapshot. This is the flow between the two obstacles. So, I mean, at the, um, not between, but at the mid, mid plane uh, of the height of the two obstacles. Um, with POD, which is this panel over here, we're able, uh, we're going to pick five POD modes and that allows us to reconstruct 32% of the energy, which is a quite low fraction of the total energy. The three outer encoder approaches are around 90%, so with only five modes, which highlights the potential of these architectures. By exploiting the non-linearities in the flow, we are able to obtain very compact reduced order models. In fact, if we look at the region between two, the two obstacles, which you can see here, you see this region of high and low velocity, uh, the POD basically doesn't identify that, right? Whereas the three autoencoder approaches are able to reconstruct the, with only five modes, the high and low speed uh, regions that you see uh, between the two obstacles. So that's an important um, aspect to keep in mind uh, when looking at these autoencoder approaches. Now, have we achieved the goal of the orthogonality? This is the determinant of the cross correlation matrix. Um, well, the POD is, of course, uh, has 100% orthogonality. That's by construction. That's uh, obvious. But the beta variation autoencoder has 99.2% orthogonality, which is quite interest interesting. This is very remarkable. We're able to have very orthogonal uh, modes in physical space, whereas the other two autoencoder approaches uh, are much less orthogonal. And that's actually, that's actually not so good, right? I mean, we need to be able to impose quite some orthogonality to interpret those modes and to be able to have some physical relevance into the ROM that we are trying to construct. So we can look at the effect of the penalization beta. And this is the parameter that goes into the loss function that I showed before. Uh, in blue, uh, I'm showing you the error in the reconstruction. Yeah? So of course, or to put it uh, in, a, in a better way, is the percentage of energy that is reconstructed uh, so, of course, for larger betas, we reconstruct less energy. We go down to 82% uh, for the largest value of beta. Uh, we also have uh, more zero variables for larger betas. And the determinant of the cross correlation matrix, so basically this um, measure of the orthogonality, goes up when I increase beta. Right? So we get very, very high level of orthogonality for the larger values of beta. So we are trading a bit the reconstruction accuracy, which is still pretty good, I mean, over 80%, by being able to have uh, modes that are orthogonal. And why is that important? Well, if we look at the modes in physical space, so basically decode them, huh? what we see here on the right is the interpretation of those modes. I'm showing you the five first modes. Um, the second column is the POD, okay? So these are the first POD modes. The third and fourth columns those are the two autoencoder approaches that are not variational. And what you can see in these two autoencoder approaches is that you don't see any, any structure in the modes. This is basically high and low frequency fluctuations everywhere. But we cannot really identify much of a physical uh, behavior there. <clears throat> of course, POD uh, is able in the first modes to identify this large scale shedding, which is very characteristic of this uh, flow case. And what we can see is that the variation autoencoder is also able to identify this large scale shading. So being able to impose the orthogonality is a very important property because we can recover some important physical uh, quantities. At the end, a particular physical phenomenon will be mapped on a particular mode and not on a number of them. So that uh, orthogonality, which translates from the statistical independence in the latent space, when you decode those into physical space, you get orthogonality. This is a very important property, and that's actually able to uh, help us build more physically motivated reduced order models. By the way, the beta variation autoencoder, with this algorithm that I'm showing here on the left, uh, allows us also to have an optimal representation. So I can rank the modes in terms of their uh, concatenated energy reconstruction in such a way that I obtain uh, well, a reduced order model, right, basically. Uh, which is comprises uh, non-linear modes from the autoencoder, which are orthogonal, and they're also um, optimal, or at least they are ranked uh, with descending contribution towards the reconstruction of the city. So that's a quite, uh, I would say, promising approach uh, to build very compact reduced order models that can help us with complex cases uh, for control, optimization, predictions, uh, etc. So this is an approach to consider um, when building ROMs in the future. Okay.
And the last application of today is flow control via deep reinforcement learning, which is an area which is uh, quite promising, actually. I believe that there is quite some um, interesting stuff to learn with deep reinforcement learning. This is a quick recap of what uh, deep reinforcement learning is doing. Uh, we consider here a schematic representation where an agent, in our case, our neural network, <laughs> is interacting with an environment, which could be the CFD code eh, that is simulating the flow that we are uh, trying to control. And um, the agent interacts with the environment through actions. Eh, and those actions are the control actions that one can perform. <clears throat> the system, the environment, is going to change its state and is going to give us a certain reward. So the reward is basically a norm of the quality of the actions depending on what we want to do. If we want to reduce the drag, then the reward will be minus the drag, basically. We want to be able to minimize the drag, so we want to maximize the reward. Um, and what we do in our deep reinforcement learning approach, we use PPO. So we're trying to uh, learn a policy such that given the state of the system, we obtain the optimal action to maximize the reward in the long term. And we're going to use this in the context of flow control. This was presented by Guastoni, um, who is a PhD student in my group in the APS last year. So you can actually see some applications, uh, in this case, to a simple 2D recirculation bubble. So we have a 2D channel uh, with a boundary condition at the top. Through suction and blowing, we introduce a separation bubble. And we want to control this bubble upstream through uh, blowing and suction. Yeah? So we want to be able to synthesize a, a, well, an active flow control strategy uh, and we'll be comparing the performance of the deep reinforcement learning based control with that of classical control. So this is how the setup looks like. <clears throat> this is the flow. In color I'm showing you the negative velocities so you can actually see the negative uh, velocities in the recirculation bubble. These orange dots are the probes that we're using to measure the velocity. This square here is the location of the actuation. <clears throat> and the actuation is going to be represented by this body force. Huh? So this body force is going to be positive or negative, trying to re reproduce what blowing and suction will do huh? in, a, in a real uh, scenario. And we're going to try to learn the amplitude of this uh, body force uh, amplitude uh, of the body force uh, term in the Navier-Stokes equations. And this uh, arrow, it represents the uh, reward function, right, which is the length of the separation bubble. What we want to do through actuation upstream of the bubble is to minimize the length of the separation bubble. And one can, of course, do classical control, classical control, which will be based on a periodic actuation. Right, uh, and that's the, the way that uh, typically this is done. Uh, but we can actually compare the performance of the deep reinforcement learning with that of uh, periodic uh, actuation, which is the classical approach. Uh, I'm showing you a video here on the left where you can see that the deep reinforcement learning is at least having a couple of frequencies. One associated with these um, wave packets that are being sent to the bubble, and the second one associated with the pulses of wave packets that are being sent. So if we compare with periodic forcing, which would be the classical approach with just a single frequency, the deep reinforcement learning is at least more complex. It's a, little more, uh, it's a richer approach to flow control. The percentage reduction of the separation bubble is uh, around 30% with the deep reinforcement learning and only 20% with the periodic force, <laughs> which in principle shows the potential and the capabilities of this deep reinforcement learning approach to be able to learn and discover novel control strategies before what we can uh, find in classical theory, which is relying a lot on linear uh, methods. We are currently using this approach for uh, control of turbulence in a turbulent channel, basically and later on for applications uh, in wings. So the idea is to be able to control the flow on wings uh, in these in this complex uh, scenarios, leveraging the capabilities of the reinforcement learning control. Okay. And this is a recap of what I told you about today. I told you about predictions using CNNs, using GANs, about model reduction using uh, autoencoders, so one can do it in a nonlinear way, uh, deep reinforcement learning for flow control. So that's also a very promising approach. Um, I'm leaving you here my information. This is my email. This is my lab, the Universal Lab, um, and my social media. So if you're interested in discussing, if you have any questions, if you want to collaborate, feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to discuss with you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And now I will take your questions. Hi. Um, so Hi. I was wondering about the early 
part you showed training uh, to compare with the DNS results. Mm -hmm. And you may have specified this and I missed it, but when you were doing the training, was the comparison, you know, to measure how well your your training was going and if you could done were done yet, uh, was that just like a direct comparison to DNS results at points in the domain uh, at those times uh, or at those distances, or was there another part to the function looking at you know uh, how well the results would meet the local model physics or, or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. So this is the comparison in terms of turbulence statistics. So these are the velocity fluctuations. This is the URMS, the VRMS, and the WRMS. And we're comparing in a statistical sense the performance, the performance of the deep learning prediction with the DNS, with the original uh, reference. So this is uh, an assessment uh, in terms of the turbulence statistics. We also compare the spectra. We, I didn't show it in the presentation, but you can find it in the paper. Um, and also the spectra was in excellent agreement. Of course, wars farther away from the wall, but in the near world region, the spectra was also in very good agreement. Uh, and also, I mean, we also looked at the instantaneous visualizations, but also the mean square error of the instantaneous uh, errors. So those, the, the mean square error goes hand in hand with the um, behavior that you can see for the turbulence statistics, actually. Is, right. Is that what is used during the training or is that what you used to assess after no, no, the, this, is a, this is a testing data set. So it's a test set that has not been seen in training at all, not even training or validation. Right. It's a completely different test. Yeah. So what, what was used during the training? Uh, well, uh, so we had um, on the order of 10,000 snapshots. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the total amount of data that we have. And then we divided that 70% uh, was for training, well, around 70, 80% for training and validation, 20% for testing. So, and it was done in a, in a randomized way, basically. So it's the same data, of course, it's the same uh, flow velocities, but the, uh, the performance of the models is against data that has never been seen during training. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I actually have a follow-up question. I was actually wondering the same thing as Natalie. So yeah. uh, thanks for clarifying that, Ricardo. In terms of these snapshots, like what what was the duration in simulation time that you tried? Yeah, so to these are uh, very well converged statistics. I mean, <clears throat> Atari Top 550, if I remember correctly, is on the order of 10,000 snapshots. Um, so in terms of simulation uh, time, I mean, this, are, this is going to be very long simulations. So we, we actually have uh, very well converged statistics for all the range of scales. Uh, it must be on the order of thousand time uh, time convective time units of the simulation. Uh, so we, we have very very converged statistics, but we also have quite some time resolution uh, to be able to assess some of the temporal dependencies of the samples. That's, that's also something that I didn't show so much today. Uh, but the data is spanning a long enough period to converge in terms of statistics, but it's having a low enough time step to be able to assess temporal dependencies of the data and the prediction of those temporal dependencies. All right. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see there's another question in the chat <clears throat> um, from Felipe. How does sparsity can be included in for reduced order models in turbulence? Well, uh, I mean, it can be done in different ways, uh, but the one that I showed uh, with autoencoders, I mean, basically it helps to, to add penalizations, right? Penalization terms. That's usually one way to, to add um, uh, sparsity. In, in particular, with this um, uh, variation autoencoders in the latent space, you are with beta, the larger this penalization, the more that you're incentivizing the model to learn statistically independent variables in the latent space, which are also of a reduced latent space size. So we are well, basically promoting a sparsity in this, turbo, in this uh, latent representation of the turbulent flow through this penalization factor here. Right. Okay, hopefully that answers your question, Felipe. Feel free to you know, post a follow-up in the chat or you know, raise your hand. Uh, says, thank you also. If I know some physics about the flow. How can I include the knowledge to the model? Yeah, that's a very important uh, point. 
I mean, in general, if we know something about the flow, we should be using it. I mean, that's that's very that's very true. And of course, one way is with transfer learning as well. So we can actually reuse some of these things that we learn in one case for another case. Uh, but one way would be um, we know that the flow is periodic. So the design of the CNN that we have with padding of the input embeds that periodicity. So we are able to obtain periodic predictions, which is something that we know about the data. Uh, technically, you could impose incompressibility by training on the um, uh, vorticity, Laplacian of the vertical velocity formulation, uh, and then in that way, you're imposing as well the, the incompressibility. Um, to do this in autoencoders is difficult. So to be able to impose physical constraints in the latent space, that's a, an area of research that is quite active and there's many people looking at it. It's not so straightforward because the latent space doesn't have an easy interpretation. But in more uh, straightforward predictions, like in these CNNs and these GANs, uh, where you're just trying to predict the flow, I mean, you should be able to, even in the data or in the design of the network, impose the um, knowledge that you have about the physics of the flow. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, I, I see Joel has his hand up as well. Hi, uh, Ricardo, uh, am I audible? Yep. Okay. I can hear you, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, really interesting talk. <laughs> uh, my question is regarding Thank the you. interfacing of the CFD with the ML code. So how is how do you interface the CFD, which you probably wrote in uh, low le lower level languages like um, C or Fortran, with um, the vastly available Python libraries for ML, or or what the was was the machine learning code also um, written along with the CFD code uh, together? Yeah, that's a good question. So for uh, most of the applications that I mentioned today, the predictions, the autoencoders, um, most of the uh, analysis was was done offline. Okay, so you in principle don't need a communication. You need to be able to read in the data, basically, but you need to communicate the CFD solver and the and the machine learning. For the last part on the deep reinforcement learning, then you need the communication because then you're doing things on the fly, right? I mean, the the um, algorithm, the reinforcement learning algorithm, is deciding an action. It's executing the action on the flow. It's simulating the flow, getting a response, getting a reward, and then you know dynamically being able to to do that. That's done. Uh, there's different fr uh, frameworks, and depending on the type of method that you want to use, you may choose one or the other. For deep reinforcement learning, we're using TensorForce, not TensorFlow, but TensorForce, which was developed by um, Jean Rabot and uh, collaborators and uh, Alexander Kuhnle, um, which is, I mean, relying on TensorFlow, but it has quite some capabilities for uh, for um, reinforcement learning. And that's well, mostly a Python layer and then some C++, but mostly Python. Uh, and then the CFD code, um, I mean, most of the CFD codes that I have discussed today, they're basically Fortran, right? Either Fortran 77 or some updates with Fortran 90. So it's basically quite uh, old code, if you wish. Um, so it's basically about being able to make the communication between both. Um, and, and well, I mean, learn a bit about the code, learn a bit about how things are called and what, where are the variables that are relevant so that you can do the communication uh, effectively. Uh, we used at the beginning uh, TCP IP uh, for, uh, sockets for communication, but at the end, uh, we ended up using uh, MPI. MPI ended up being uh, the most efficient approach. Um, there is one point here, and it's that if you want to do things at very large scale, and these turbulent cases that I've shown, I mean, they're turbulent, they're large cases, but not very, very, very large, uh, then at some point it becomes more and more important to communicate the machine learning and the CFD. And of course, uh, or parallelize things, it gets a bit of a complicated computer science problem. But I believe it's one step that we need to take sooner or later uh, to be able to, to go into real uh, large scale applications. Okay, thanks. So, so what you're saying is that uh, there is some amount of interfacing done between the uh, machine learning and CFD codes. And yeah. for larger scale applications, it makes more sense to uh, integrate the two into one single language. For, um... Well, I'm not saying that it makes sense to do it in the same language. I mean, to take a code, a massively parallel CFD code and rewrite it in Python, I mean, maybe it's going to be... No, 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 so... I mean the other way around, to write the machine learning code in, in, uh, in uh, let's say... It like could be, it could be. I mean, it depends also on the architecture that you're using. So it, it's not fully clear what is the best way to do it. Uh, I, I think, to me, more critical than the language that you use for the machine learning part, uh, the most critical is the parallelization of the machine learning part, which is quite challenging as well. 
So I can tell you that uh, even if the prediction part, uh, the first uh, application that I showed, the one on the channel, that was done offline, but even to do the training at Reynolds Tau 550, which are already quite large um, data sets, then we had to change some of the parallelization uh, inherent in TensorFlow uh, for, for that case. Uh, if you want to do that in situ as you're running the simulation, it might be uh, a challenging task. So, so that's something that uh, well, one needs to think about. And uh, to me, that's more critical, the parallelization than the language itself. They're connected, but the priority should be on the parallelization uh, because at some point you're going to have architectures with high percentage of the machine being GPUs and other percentage being CPUs and having the machine learning and the CFD at the same time running. So there will be some challenges there to think about from the computer science point of view. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Joel. Uh, any more, any more questions? Uh, I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, there's no hands up. So yeah, I, I think we can conclude the seminar. Thank, thank you, Ricardo, very much, and I want to thank all the audience members for coming. Oh, great. I, I see, I see another hand up. Uh, yep. Or maybe that was, maybe that was accidental. Okay, never mind. Okay, so. We conclude the seminar. Thanks a lot. Thank Ricardo. you very much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure and I'm very happy to keep discussing and getting in touch. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks.